This is the section on inlets and compressors. First we'll talk about intakes. Intakes, inlets, same difference. There's three reasons why we have intakes on jet engines. We need to control the angle of the air going into the engine, going into the compressor, the pressure, and the velocity, for instance. If we have a jet engine, and here some compressor blades, this intake right here is going to help make sure that by the time the air comes in it's hitting the compressor blades at a 90 degree angle as much as possible and of course if it's slightly uh, divergent gets a little bigger we'll reduce the velocity to increase the pressure Typically, the airframe manufacturer designs the intake duct because it knows how fast the forward speed is of the engine. If uh, we've got a jet engine and how divergent that intake duct needs to be, how big it gets is going to be based on what V1 is going to be. So it might need to be a little bit more diverging or a little bit less based on how fast the engine is going. So the engine manufacturer, it's going to make the it's going to make the engine based on uh what it thinks is the best way to go, but this intake and we'll find out later the exhaust the exact spe specifications of it is going to be determined by the airframe manufacturer. And there's three basic kinds of ducts. Low speed, high subsonic like above 0.6 but below 1.0 and then supersonic you know my favorite kind low speed ducts are in the shape of a bell mouth inlet if we have a jet airplane jet engine rather and here's our compressor blades and here's our turbines combustor and we have the intake duct perfectly straight then this engine when it's sucking and you know it's going to blow like crazy so it's going to pull air in like crazy but this molecule right here is going to get attracted this molecule right here way more than this molecule way out here it's going to get pulled in well it's got a curve to it so the problem here is that this area right here and this area right here doesn't get much very much air because there's a little bit, not much, but a little bit of inertia to this air. So what you're going to need to do to prevent that whoops, is have a bell mouth inlet. And a bell mouth inlet it just means that it gets bigger, of course, you know, the shape right here, there's a bell. So this bell mouth inlet allows for, takes into account the fact that this air is going to curve a bit. So by the time the air molecules hit the compressor, they're going straight at a 90 degree angle to the compressor. Uh, the downside to the bell mouth inlet is that it does not increase the pressure of the air, but it does allow you to get the greatest amount of airflow when you're not trying to shove it in. We'll get to it here shortly. If we're flying fast, say above 0.6, we're going to be shoving plenty of air into the engine, but below that, we're not going to worry so much about how much pressure we can get out of the intake, but the fact that we can get plenty of air. And you're going to find Bellmouth inlets on APUs because they go slow and helicopters because they go slow and really slow turboprops and here remember this line this would be all airspeed effects we did this on the last lecture all airspeed effects versus thrust and this is the curve that we're talking about right here with this being Mach 1.0 and somewhere right around here being 0.06 and this being 0 Mach and so we're this Bellmouth Inlet we're talking about stuff in here where even if we had a diverging duct it wouldn't make much difference on increasing our thrust. High subsonic speeds of course we're talking Mach 0.6 to 0.9-ish 
some zeros in there. That's what we're talking high subsonic, and this is what we're going to be talking about when we're talking about turbo prop or correction turbo fans and turbo jets that are subsonic. They're going to be cruising, you know, somewhere around 0 0.7, 0 0.8, 0 0.85. And they have a diverging duct. Of course, we've already gone through all that. If we have a diverging duct, the air is going to curve a little bit. Its axial velocity is going to go down. But the static pressure will go up. And then, of course, we'll have our compressor blades right after that. So we'll actually have an increase in static pressure. And this increase can be one and a half, oops, can be one and a half times the outside ambient air pressure. So we can have a one and a half to one increase in pressure. So if pressure ambient is equal to 10 psi, then the pressure that's coming into the first compressor blade would be 15 psi or one and a half times greater than the inlet pressure. And we're going to find divergent ducts on turbo jets, turbo fans, and turbo props that go really fast. But I gotta tell you that I've been exaggerating this divergent duct here. It's not really this diverging. In fact, if you looked into the intake of a jet engine, you would barely be able to tell if here's the engine case, it's gonna come in just a little bit, and here it's gonna come in just a, whoops, just a little bit and then get straight. So this divergence is not very much. It's going to be really hard to see it, but it is going to be there. Then, of course, supersonic inlet ducts. Sweet! you got to understand that those compressor blades in a jet engine are subsonic airflow, or subsonic airfoils. So the air that hits it right at the moment you get to the compressor, this has to be less than Mach 1.0. Because you've got to remember, we've got to have, this thing has to produce a lot of power at takeoff, during the takeoff roll, and that's totally subsonic. You know, it starts out at zero knots, true airspeed, so we're going to be Mach, Mach 0.0 .0 when we start out. So this engine has to produce a lot of thrust during this takeoff roll, so we've got to have these compressor blades being able to work good at subsonic speeds, and so they're going to be efficient, and most supersonic airplanes don't fly supersonic most of the time anyway except maybe an SR-71, the Concorde and I guess the uh, F-22 Raptor can cruise supersonic without running the afterburners but we still gotta get off the ground so you gotta do something with this intake so that you can have um, subsonic airflow so the engine can run well but now you gotta stay with subsonic airflow through the engine so one way to do it the Concorde did it, was they had a ramp that would come up. And it would stay flat during takeoff and landing and stuff at slow speeds, but as you got up close to Mach 1, this ramp would rise, and the airflow coming in, sub supersonic, you would get a shock wave at that ramp. Well, on the downstream side, if you look at asymmetric airfoils flying through the air, and if you get close enough, say you're going Mach 8, Mach 0.9, you're going to get a shock wave off the top of the wing and on the downstream side the velocity goes down but the static pressure goes up. Sweet! We're going to be on the downstream side of the shock wave and so the pressure is going to go up and the velocity is going to go down. So we're going to have subsonic airflow going hitting the compressor blades and we're going to have the static pressure go up. So we're going to actually convert this, this supersonic air to subsonic and that energy and velocity is going to be converted into higher pressure so it's actually pretty cool and there's more than one way to do it you can put a spike and a probe and you can look in the picture in the books for that stuff you just gotta cause a shock wave so that we'll get subsonic airflow the byproduct is that we increase the pressure dramatically and in fact in the SR-71 which cruised at Mach 3 just the intake alone would have a 40 to 1 ram effect. So if you're flying along really, really high and it's 1 PSI out there coming into your engine, you could actually, if we were going supersonic, you could actually have a 40 PSI airflow going into those first set of compressors. So you can have a huge change in pressure when you're going supersonic. 
and of course what goes supersonic turbo jets and of course nobody's making turbo jets but there's a few out there still flying and then turbo fans low bypass turbo fans they're not very big in diameter the fans don't have a big bypass ratio but you need to have decent fuel economy at cruise so they're going to be low bypass turbo fans say two to one three to one or four to one bypass ratio you can put stuff on the intake on the inlet blow indoors if you look at a harrier jump jet or you look at a 747-400 or you look at a b52 h model uh, those engines had so here's the intake they had if you watch uh, a true lies with uh, the governor of california and he ends up flying that uh, that harrier jump jet if i recall let's see right here and he's flying that Harrier jump jet and the forward speed is really low say in a hover but we've got this engine cooking in here and we have it at a very 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 high power setting and we need to get a lot of air in the engine well this this intake if we made it big enough for hover power we'd really need to make the intake bigger but then at cruise speed the intake would be too big and it would cause a lot of drag so these blow-in doors are spring-loaded closed just a little tiny bit at low forward speeds you gotta remember this engine here it's sucking air in big time we're gonna actually have a slightly lower static pressure because we're pulling in the air so fast so these doors are gonna open inward and let air in in addition to the intake air is gonna go in these blow-in doors as we get a high forward speed and we start jamming air in there and compressing it then the pressure is going to go back up and it's going to close these doors there's no mechanism other than a spring to keep them closed most of the time works pretty good particle separators a particle separator is designed on helicopters to keep the engine from sucking in a bunch of dust you gotta remember during uh, even a low power setting say idle we're pulling air into the engine at a couple of hundred miles an hour so think about a piece of sand hitting your eye at 200 miles an hour it's going to hurt pretty good well if you throw enough sand into a jet engine and it hits the compressor blades at a couple of hundred miles an hour even at idle it's going to scrape off a little tiny bit of metal it's going to wear it off so it's actually going to reduce the aerodynamic efficiency of the compressor blades and now you're going to have to burn more fuel for the engine to operate correctly so you don't want the engine to wear out prematurely so you put particle separators I'll come back to uh, to this picture in a second here's a particle separator found on the engines on the Blackhawks and the uh, whoops the engine is right here with the compressor blades and so there are veins in here that are curved so the air going through here swirls and the and the uh, inertia pulls the the higher uh, weight particles the dust and dirt and sand out towards the outside and the less inertia air goes through straight through and this outside air in here gets pumped out by another fan this little tiny fan runs off of the engine and blows the, this dirt and dust and sand overboard so the vast majority of the air that actually gets into the engine is pretty clean and that's the theory of operation of most um, particle separators on helicopters is to spin the air around the high uh, inertia dust and dirt gets flung outward we pull the air in through the middle and that goes into the engine now there is one airplane that's got uh, a particle separator or I should say one engine it's a Pratt & Whitney uh, PT6 and if you go out look at the uh, Beach 1900s out at the airport they have Pratt & Whitney PT6's and the intake for the engine is actually in the back of the engine and the airflow comes in and the airflow goes through the engine and then makes a turn and goes out so the engines actually bolted into the airplane backwards but they have a duct out in the front underneath the engine and air comes in it most of the time the air can just make this nice leisurely 90 degree turn in here and no problem but if you're gonna have ice and you might be sucking up particles of ice you flip the switch and this door right here moves down Oops, try a different color. This door moves down. This door right here, which was closed, moves up. And now what happens 
is that if there's any ice, the ice ha is, has a higher inertia and it tends to go in a straight line. The air has less inertia, it can turn easier. So the, the uh, ice gets thrown, ice particles get thrown overboard and the air gets to go into the intake. Now, we're going to cover it when we get to that chapter, but this intake uh, is heated so ice won't stick to it, so when you flip the switch that comes on. But this is the only particle separator I've seen on a non-helicopter. But they don't call it a particle separator, they call it part of the anti-icing system. If you have any questions about inlets, you know how to get a hold of me. If you have any suggestions on how to make this lecture better, please get a hold of me. Engine compressors. There are three main purposes for compressors. Yes, we've already covered the first two. Uh, the two big ones are to increase pressure, so we'll have lower TSFC and increase molecules per cubic inch so we can have more power for the same size engine. But we're going to bleed air off of that compressor. When I say bleed air, here is our engine. And we've got our compressor blades being driven by the turbine. And there's a lot of things we could do with a, a little bit of compressed air. If we let this air get compressed and then we bleed it off, you know, hence the name, hence the term bleed, then it's hot. Yeah, the pressure is high. And this means it's got energy in it and we can do something with that. Now you'll notice it's bled off before the combustion chamber so it's clean. For the airframe the most likely thing we're going to do is we're going to pump in, uh, we're going to use it for the pressurization of the airplane cabin. But for the engine we can do several things with it and one of them is we can route it back. We can route this air back to the intake and let it bleed out some holes and we can keep the intake skin hot so ice can't stick to it. Also you gotta understand that this although this compressed air is hot compared to outside air it certainly isn't very hot compared to uh, the air going in the turbine blades. So you could actually route it back and blow it through the turbine blades and keep the turbine blades cooler. You know if this is 500 to 800 degrees Celsius I mean uh, Fahrenheit, actually. I only did look this up in Fahrenheit. Look it up in Celsius. 500, 800 Fahrenheit, and it's probably that probably means it's like 200 to uh, 400 degrees Celsius. And the air coming in here is at 1,000 degrees Celsius. Then 200 to 400 degrees Celsius is pretty good. So we can blow that through the turbines and keep them from melting. So this bleed air, taking air off of the compressor, is going to be uh, very important when it comes to operating a jet engine. Now what does each do for the engine? Already told your pressure is lower TSFCs. More molecules per cubic inch is higher thrust. And bleed air is going to be used for lots of things. Anti-ice and uh, cooling the turbines. And we're going to stick to uh, what does it do for the engine, not what does it do for the airframe. Uh, the downside is, of course, that if we take bleed air off of the engine, we had to burn fuel to do it. So if we bleed air off for anti-ice, for cooling the turbine, it's, we're going to have to burn a little bit more fuel. And of course, if we bleed air off to run the pressurization system on the airplane, it's going to take us a little more fuel. And of course, the byproduct of increased pressure is higher temperatures. We haven't figured out how to compress air without heating it up. And there are three basic types of compressors. We'll start with centrifugal. Centrifugal compressors. They call it centrifugal because the air gets flowing outward. And here I'll draw a centrifugal compressor. And I'm looking at it from the side. And there's one in the classroom. And the air gets pulled in. Sometimes this is called the eye. Right here where the air gets pulled in. This piece of rotating machinery right here is an impeller. And the diffuser 
is right after it. So we're going to draw a line and we're going to call this the diffuser. And there's one all the way around it. And whoops, I'll show you a picture. I'll show you another picture here. Whoops. I guess I don't want to. Here we go. Draw it in different ink. Well, let's see. I want to give you a chance to draw that thing. There you go. You can draw it. So we've got the impeller. You don't have to draw the blades on it. Uh, but on the test, you ought to be able to, if I said draw one stage of a centrifugal compressor, you would draw the impeller and you would draw the diffuser on both sides. And then I'd say, like, draw an arrow showing airflow. So the air goes this way and the air also gets flung outward this way. So since the air gets flung outward due to rotation, that's why they call it a centrifugal compressor. And you'll notice that this diffuser gets bigger. This is this diffuser here is actually a divergent duct. So that means that we're going to trade off velocity to give us higher static pressures. The impeller it's adding energy. Bernoulli's theorem says that in a closed energy system, that is, you're not adding or subtracting air, uh, energy, but in the impeller, we are definitely adding energy. So in the impeller, the velocity goes up and the static pressure goes up. And then, so we definitely get an increase in pressure. And then we're going to take this high velocity and reduce it so we can get higher pressures. So we're going to definitely have a higher pressure going through the impeller and then definitely higher pressure come through the diffuser. It's just in the diffuser there's no moving parts, so we're going to have to have a trade-off between velocity and pressure. And of course, impeller and diffuser together is one stage. And I already told you this part here, and I already told you that part there. Wow. Now here are the blades coming out of the diffuser, or correction, coming out of the impeller. So here's the impeller. You do not have to draw this on the test. And you notice that there's a vein right here. There's a piece of metal in the way right here, and there's a piece of metal right here. You'll notice that the distance right here and the distance right here is not the same. It's getting bigger. So we're going to add energy to this air. Of course, we're going to blow it, fling it straight outward, and of course, this uh, Ro this uh, impeller is rotating, so we're going to have, uh, whoops, it's rotating in this direction. Let's try that again. We're going to have two vectors here. We're going to have one vector that's getting flung outward, and we're going to have another vector of the air getting pushed uh, straight if we add these two vectors together, we're going to get an angle, and in this case it's flinging it out pretty good. This line ought to be longer. So here would be our vector. Um, so there's a little vector analysis of the air coming out of the impeller. Uh, but the part that I want you to see is in the diffuser, this uh, is a diverging duct, and so the air going through it, the velocity is going to go down and the static pressure is going to go up. And here's another graph to show that. Here's uh, the center line of that impeller. Air comes in, gets flung outward. Velocity goes up. At the same time, the pressure or pressure and velocity both go up. And then in the diffuser right here, if we look at it from the side, the diffuser is where it's getting bigger. So we're going to trade this velocity. Velocity is going to get less. Velocity is going to get less. But pressure is going to go up. So you notice higher pressure in the impeller. and higher pressure going through the diffuser right here. Okay, there's more than one way to put together a compressor with a centrifugal compressor with centrifugal compressor stages. One way is if you just have one stage, so here's our impeller and here's our diffuser. But we're only going to get a certain amount of compression from it. We might say, you know what, let's put a second one on here. And let's run this air back. You don't have to, I'm not going to make you draw this on the test. So, and of course then we need another diffuser off of there. 
and that's going to end up going into the combustion chamber. So here would be the airflow. Airflow comes in, gets flung outward. Airflow comes in, gets flung outward, and velocity goes uh, uh, goes down. Here comes the airflow, and then we're going to do it again. So then we'll do it again. So now what's going to happen is if we have a single stage in, uh, compressor, we're going to get about six to one compression from where the air enters the first impeller to where it leaves the diffuser. Then to do it again across the impeller through the diffuser we're going to get about two and a half to one. You'll notice that six whoops I'd like you to notice that six times 2.5 equals about 15. The entire compressor, if we have a two stage, two stages of uh, centrifugal compression, will have about a 15 to 1 compression ratio from where the air enters to where the air leaves to go to the combustion section or the combustor. So if we're flying along at some altitude that has 10 PSI as our outside air pressure, this air pressure going to the combustor is going to be 15 times that, or 150, or 150 pounds per square inch. So we do can do pretty good. The problem is uh, if we keep adding uh, impellers, their efficiency goes down. First we have 6 to 1, then it's 2.5 to 1. I'm not sure what the third one is. It's probably 0.5 to 1. But every time we put on one of these uh, impellers, then we're going to have to burn fuel to drive it. So if we have, if we double the number of impellers, and they, they're, I just say they're identical, remember we got to have a shaft and it's got to be driven by by turbines. If we put a third one on there, we're going to have to put more turbines on there, and we're going to have to burn more fuel. And it's not worth the amount of extra fuel to burn to get the energy to go to drive this third uh, compressor stage. Because if we only get 0.5 to 1 increase, that's only going from 15... 15 to 15.5 uh, to 1 compression ratio and the extra fuel we'd have to burn we'd have to burn 33 percent more fuel because we're driving this third one so our increase in uh, in uh, compression isn't worth it so you're never gonna see a centrifugal compressor that has more than two stages you're never gonna see one with three nobody's ever built one there's a dual entry uh, there's actually one in the uh, classroom and you're only going to find those on some old engines or some APUs and here's the the turbines we got to have a combustion chamber in here but we got to let air in here and we also since we got to have a big old diffuser you know to get air to the combustion chamber we got to let air in here but this dual entry, this dual entry, we have to let air in and go around the engine and go between the tubes and and enter. We've got to let air go around and between the tubes and enter. So that now we have this huge diameter engine, a huge diameter cowling, so we got lots and lots of drag. It does double the the uh, volume does go way up. But uh, the pressure stays the same, so we didn't double the pressure. So if we really want to increase fuel economy, we're going to go two-stage so we can increase the pressure. So you're not likely to see any dual entries unless you fly in like a, an F-86 from the, you know, the 1950s, or you find some APU where you need a lot of volume of air. Covered that one. Now the advantage of, of centrifugal compressors, and we'll talk about them here in a minute, uh, over axial compressors is each stage we have a lot of compression. The first stage is going to be six to one. The next stage is going to be two and a half to one. And these are generic numbers. These aren't exact. Every single compressor, uh, the first stage is six to one. The second one's two and a half to one. But it's pretty close. So we have a lot of compression per stage. We're going to get to the axial compressors. It only they only have one point two to one per stage. So these are reasonably high. So that's good. Uh, they don't 
weigh very much so they'll spin up fast they don't make a lot of weight so this would be really good in an APU or a helicopter engine where weight is a significant factor so you're almost always going to see some com uh, centrifugal compressors in helicopter engines and APUs. Uh, FOD stands for foreign object damage I before E except after C and in foreign let's say I spell these two foreign I before E except after C and in foreign. Uh, foreign object damage. It's really hard for me to spell in my head. I got to write it down. Foreign object damage. That's where from some from something from outside of the airplane. Hence the term foreign. Uh, some object, some piece of something hits the inside of the engine and damages it, breaks it, does something bad to it. So those blades the uh, on a centrifugal compressor impeller those blades are made out of really thick metal and they can handle getting whacked with something a lot better than the thin blades of an axial compressor so they have a high resistance to foreign object damage and off design airflow that means if the airflow coming in the engine let's just say for instance here's uh, the compressor oops that's a pretty lousy one but alright if the air comes in straight everything's going to be hunky dory but if the air comes in sideways then in a centrifugal compressor it'll handle it without having a compressor stall these blades won't stall if we have an axial blade compressor air flowing in is great but air coming in sideways is going to mess things up for instance if the air is coming in sideways what about right here it's going to mess up the airflow in this part of the blade so axial compressor blades are more susceptible to airflow that is not what the instru the uh, engineer designed that is off design airflow is not what the engineer wanted to occur. Uh, co centrifugal compressors can handle that and not have compressor stalls as nearly as often. And of course I said if it weighs less then it'll spin up faster because it has less inertia. You can actually have a smaller starter motor. The main disadvantage is, is that you're stuck. For the overall compression for the entire compressor section is still going to be 15 to 1 and that's if you use both stages and so you're going to be stuck not going pat much past that you know I'm sure a newer one they've designed it to be 16 or 17 to 1 but we'll use 15 to 1 for the test uh, but we're only going to be able to get the TSFC to go down so far and then we're not going to be able to do any better so that's the disadvantage axial compressors on the other hand uh, they call it axial because the airflow is parallel to the axis of the engine. So I'm going to, instead of drawing a stick this time, I'm going to draw, you know, an actual blade. We'll put some turbines back here and blah, blah, blah. All right. Then right behind each rotating blade is going to be a stationary blade. Yeah, well, next time you come to class, you got to take a look at that engine cutaway. And, uh, whoops. and it'll really give you a good idea now I didn't draw this very well, the uh, rotating blades are immediately after, there's no space there's no space right after it it's going to be the stationary blades there we go so now here we have a rotor that's the part that rotates, hence the term rotor what am I up to? Three this time? Here, we'll just say it's two. And uh, this is the stator. It says stator because it's stationary, you know, hence the term stator. And when the air comes in, the rotor adds energy to it. So just like the impeller of a centrifugal compressor, we're adding energy so Bernoulli's theorem doesn't work. We don't have to have one go down to one for one going up. We're going to add static pressure and we're going to add velocity to it. And then the stator, and I'll show you a picture here again, is uh, going to be, oh, I can't even draw a good picture. Let's see if I have a good picture. It's going to be a diverging duct. Now that's not a good picture. I know I got one. Just hang on. Let's see what we can do here. Here's a picture of a large compressor, and these are all the different stages of the rotating blades. And these ones, these here, don't move at all. This case is going to get pushed in, and so there's going to be a rotor, and then a stator, and a rotor, and a stator, and a rotor, and a stator. Let's see if I can go back one if that did any good. Oh. I know there's a picture in here I want to show you. 
sooner or later it'll come up well maybe I'm just gonna have to draw it oh this is a decent picture here it's better than me drawing so uh, this is part of a compressor and there's gonna be a disc in here and this rotating blade and there's gonna be a rotating blade out here somewhere and so this one's stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary I, you probably get the idea here rotating stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary okay so each one of these stages right here uh, with a stationary and a rotating blade is going to be one stage and that's going to give us 1.2 in one one point two times to greater pressure than what came into it so if here's one two three four oops I guess I, I did I made an error there who me an error uh, Axial compressors are made up of a rotating blade, which is always in the front, and then the stationary blade. So this would be one stage. And then this would be one stage, rotating in the front and then stationary, because we've got to add the velocity, we've got to add pressure, and then the static blade, the stator, since from here going through the stator blade, Bernoulli's theorem works, because this one's not moving, it's not adding energy. So if we reduce the velocity, we can increase the static pressure. So there's a stage, here's a stage, here's a stage, here's a stage. It's going to be a rotor and then a stator, a rotor and then a stator. So we're going to, this has quite a few stages. So if each one of these stages has an increase in pressure of 1.2, then we could figure it out and say, okay, this is 1.2 times. 1.2 times 1.2 times 1.2 and on and on and on. Let's just say for fun that this was a 10 stage axial compressor. Whoops, can't spell axial. There we go. Axial compressor. Then we would have 1.2 to the 10 would equal the compression ratio. So you can try figuring that. I'm not going to make you do math on that. But it's just like an axe, just like a centrifugal pre compressor where it was 6 to 1 and then the second stage was 2 to 1 that gave us 15 for the overall compression for the engine here we're again we're going to multiply the compression ratio of each stage times all the others and that'll give us the total in the end and of course this one has lots of stages in it now, the disadvantage to axial compressors is that the blades are much, much thinner metal, so it's much more susceptible to foreign object damage. It's actually higher weight for same compression. So if we had a two-stage centrifugal, and I'm just going to draw the, well, there's the impellers, and this is 6 to 1, and this is 2 and a half to 1, it would give us 15 to 1 compression ratio, but in a uh, jet engine with an axial compressor, let's say we're going to have to have 1.2 times 1.2 times 1.2 times 1.2. By the time we, we do that enough to get 15, we have a bunch of stages. And, of course, we've got to have the, uh, the static, the stator blades in here, too. The weight of this thing to give us 15 to 1 is much greater than the weight of these two centrifugal compressors even if they pumped out the exact same volume they pumped out the exact same volume and the exact same pressure the exact same pressure this axial would weigh noticeably more and of course since this rotating stuff weighs a lot more it's going to take longer to spin up our spool up time is going to be greater and we're going to need a bigger starter motor the big advantage which is a really big advantage is that we can keep putting stage after stage after stage and get 1.2 times 1.2 times 1.2 it's not infinite but we can go a long way and modern 
turbofan engines found in transport category jets are higher than a 30 to 1 compression ratio. Well, this higher pressure, if we have the engine core, you know, here's a big old fan, and we got these compressor blades, this pressure right here, the higher it is going into the combustion chamber to burn fuel, the lower our TSFC, the better our fuel economy. And if you're trying to fly an airliner, then that TSFC is a really, really, really big deal. For instance, here is a chart. Now, this is an older chart. And here's TSFC, or SFC, TSFC. And, of course, this one only goes down to 0.5. And if we look at modern jet airliners like, say, a GE90 or a Pratt & Whitney 4000 series engine like you'd find on a 77, uh, at cruise, TSFC is going to be about 0.35, but this chart's a little outdated. You'll notice, uh, if we were at 15 to 1, like a two-stage axial compressor, then we'd have a TSFC of about 0.65. But if we doubled our compression ratio to 30, it's only come down to 0.5. So this is not a linear chart. It's uh, logarithmic or uh, exponentially exponential. And so it, it doesn't get perfectly flat, but it goes down really, really slow. So we may be, uh, you know, we could go to 35 to 1 on the compression ratio, but how much reduction in fuel flow did we get by sticking in those extra compressors? Because if we stick in the extra compressors, we're going to have to burn more fuel to drive extra turbines, so the power spins the compressor. So at some point, engine manufacturers are going, you know, if we put another compressor blade in there, it won't be worth it. Uh, but advances in aerodynamics, this curve isn't the same anymore. This curve is getting is lower than it used to be. So now with a 35 to 1, we might have a 0.35 TSFC. And this is at cruise. This is not like at idle or at takeoff power settings. Uh, so you can see that going from a 15 to 1 compression ratio to a 30 to 1 compression ratio, you know, we're reducing the TSFC, certainly, but it's not like if we double the compression, we cut the fuel flow in half. It's not that good. And, of course, the answer to this is, if the weight of the fuel that you save is greater than the extra weight of the engine, then it's worth it. If your engine weighs 500 pounds more than it would have otherwise, but you burn 1,000 pounds less fuel, you saved 500 pounds. So now you can put extra cargo, extra passengers, and charge money. Or if you wanted to fly farther, you could use, put another 500 pounds of fuel on it, but you could use it to go farther. So if you're trying to make money, you're going to be looking for a low TSFC engine, which means you want the highest compression possible, which means you're going to go for with an axial compressor. And sure enough, if you look at transport category jets, they all have axial compressors. Now you can stick a uh, several axial compressor stages, and I'm not going to draw the stationary blades in here, and then have a uh, centrifugal compressor and a uh, stage and you'll get a combination of it. You'll get better TSFC because you have higher compression and but you'll save weight because you'll have uh, a centrifugal impeller which doesn't weigh as much for the amount of pressure. So in this case it'd be 1.2 times 1.2 that is the compression ratio of the engine. 1, 2, 3, 4, 5 times 1.2, times 1.2, times 1.2, and then this one right here would be 6, times 6. So we could find out what the compression ratio of this entire compressor section is. I guess it would be like that. All right. Let's look in the front of an engine, and let's look at the blades. The tip speed going around is going to add, just because it's spinning, even with a zero forward speed. If we took the same engine and looked at it on the top, 
we're also going to have to take into account that relative speed. If we also take into account the uh, this arrow right here due to the uh, due to the uh, rotation of the engine, the actual tip speed vector. If we added this vector and the added this vector and the distances were representing velocity, then this is the longest line right here. So we got to worry about the fact that our forward speed vectorially added to the uh, tip speed due to rotation. When this starts coming up on Mach 1.0, then we're going to have a lot of drag. So I think I've drawn this. So if this is Mach 1.0 and this is drag, this is going to go up. It's a smoother line. It, it doesn't bend quite so much. But we want to stay, keep that tip speed back from there. So what happens is that if we get a larger diameter engine with blades going all the way out, if we kept the same RPM, we're going to get a, this, this line here is going to get longer when we have a larger diameter compressor blade or a fan. So that means that this line here is going to get longer and it's going to be easier to come up on Mach 1. So essentially what I'm saying is if we have a turbo fan, then this fan blade, the bigger the diameter, we're going to have to slow it down so our blade tips don't come up on Mach 1 and have a lot of drag. So and that goes for a compressor as well. So if you notice a really small diameter engine, the RPM can be really, really fast without the blade tips coming up on Mach 1. And the bigger the diameter of the engine, the slower the RPMs we have to spin it so the blade tips don't come up on Mach 1 and have lots and lots of drag. I got a really nice one. All right, this is so good. All right. So this is a rotating one. This is a stationary one. So there's got to be a rotating one. So let's just say this this right here, this dotted line, that's the center line of the engine, and they took out the fan. So the fan's going to be huge. So this fan, however big it is, that's the first rotating, and so the airflow is going to go through it. So we're going to have a stationary. So that's going to give us one stage of compression. So rotating and stationary, that's going to give us one stage. So let's just look. This rotating blade here, this is the rotor and this is the stator. You'll notice that the velocity goes up. This is the velocity. And pressure goes up. This line is pressure. So that makes sense that we're adding energy. Velocity can go up as well as uh, pressure can go up since we're adding energy. But now that we run it through the stator and that's not uh, adding energy, then we can't have both of them rise. So but we, what we want is a rise in pressure, and we're going to do that by making the velocity go down. Then we're going to hit the next rotor, and it's going to kick up the velocity, kick up the pressure, then it's going to hit the next stator, and to get the pressure to go up, we're going to set the velocity down. So in the rotor, Bernoulli's theorem doesn't work, but in the stator, Bernoulli's theorem does, because we don't we're not extracting or adding energy. In the rotor, Bernoulli's theorem doesn't work. I guess I could put a B and put a line through it, yeah. And then in the stator, since Bernoulli's theorem does work, does work, we're going to have to have a trade-off. So this is going to happen every time we have a stage, you know, rotor and then a stator, rotor and a stator, rotor and a stator. You're probably getting sick of this, rotor and a stator. So that the pressure continues to go up, but the velocity, we keep jamming it up by adding energy and then sucking the velocity out to get pressure. So that's going to keep happening across each of the stages. Okay, I already gave you a little bit of this. The uh, centrifugal force is flowing in the airflow out, and since the uh, rotating impeller is flowing it outward, we're going to get a rotating vector for the airflow. So that there's going, and it's going to be a little bit more than that. So the outgoing vector is going to be in this direction. So here we have th these lines aren't quite as accurate as I'd like. This uh, vector getting thrown outward and the vector of the rotation is going to equal this line right there. So there's a little vector analysis, I know, big fun. You were waiting for that, weren't you? Axial vector analysis. Now here, uh, I kind of like this picture, and I kind of don't. you got to understand, here is a rotor. And here, this one over there, is a stator. 
but there isn't this distance. This distance does not exist. They just put that in there so they could tell you about where the airflow was. So if this rotor is moving, the rotor is moving in this direction. And as the air goes through it, it's going to get flung in this direction. So we're going to have one vector right here. But the airflow is going to be moving through the compressor. So it's going to be moving down through the compressor. So we're going to have this velocity vector here. If we add this vector and we add this vector right here, the end result is this vector. So I so uh the in reality these two blades right here are going to be right up here. So there's this comes by, the air is going to go right smack into it. They just separated it because they wanted to draw these vectors. So now here is the stator. Remember the stator I was talking about that it trades off velocity so that we can get higher pressures and you can see the distance across here is less than the distance across here so that's a diverging duct in a diverging duct the velocity is going to go down and the static pressure is going to go up because these are stationary blades they're not moving we're not adding any any energy so Bernoulli's theorem is going to work I hope you're happy so am I. I I'm happy and you can cross this out. Let's not worry about that one. Da -da -da. And... Yeah, I don't want to look at that one either. Fans, turbo fans, fans on turbo fans. you got to drive that fan. Now the stick diagrams that I made you draw before, if here's our duct, here's our big old honking fan, and we're going to have this engine core in here. We've got to have compressors, we got to have a combustion chamber, we got to have turbines to drive the compressor, and we're going to have some turbines to drive the fan. Now this works out fine until these blade tips start getting fat too fast coming up on Mach 1 and we start having drag, blade tip drag. So at some point we're going to go, you know what, we got to figure out a way to make this fan spin slower. So here's one way to do it. Here is the fan and we're going to drive it, let's just say, off of the last couple of turbines. And now, instead of putting in the uh, the regular turbines to drive the compressor, I'll do it with a different color here, we're going to have a compressor blades, but these compressor blades are not going to be hooked on to the same shaft. We're going to have a hollow shaft and put some turbines in here to drive the compressor. So now, if we looked up the engine, like right at this point right here, we'd see there was a hollow tube, which on one end is turbines and on one end is compressors, and then in the middle of it, we'd see this metal shaft on one end turbines and on the other end on fans. So now what can happen is these turbines right here and the fan, which are bolted together, they can spin slow. So the fan can spin slow, but the rest of the compressor and these turbines can spin fast because these compressors will be a lot more efficient if we spin those things fast. So this fan and these turbines are going to be called N1. If this is a two-spool engine or a dual-spool engine, I think that, yeah, multi, a multi-spool engine, in this case it's got two spools, um, the first thing that the air hits and everything that is bolted to it, the first thing that the air hits, bam, is the fan, and everything bolted to it, so everything bolted to it, that's the N1 spool. So if you look into the front of the engine, you're going to see N1. If you look into the tailpipe, you're going to see N1. You could call this the CN1 compressor. Now you got to understand, because the fan, the air going through the fan is compressed. So the fan is actually part of the compressor. It's just being spun off of a different shaft. But if you look inside of a jet engine and it's a multi-spool engine, you're going to see the N1 turbine in the back. You're going to see the N1 compressor in the front. That means that the second thing that the air hits and everything that's bolted onto it is going to be N2.
So this the N2 compressor and the N2 turbines are going to be bolted to each other. You're going to have an RPM gauge in the cab cockpit that says N1 and another RPM gauge that says N2 because you got two different things spinning around in the cock inside of the engine. And two is going to spin faster, so the compressor will be efficient. And one is going to spin slowly, so the fan can cannot have high blade tip drag, so it can spin slowly. And of course, the same shaft as the compressor. That's this stick diagram that I've already had you drawn, and that works good for smaller diameter fans. But at some point, you're going to have to go to multi spool. Now, here's what's way cool is that uh, Pratt & Whitney and General Electric tended to stay having airplanes that had N1 and, and N2. Rolls-Royce, on the other hand, they said, you know what, I think we need a third spool. They actually did an N3. They put in another set of compressor blades and some turbines to drive it and another set of compressor blades and some turbines to drive it. And then they said, you know what, this will be N3. So they actually had to go to having a third gauge. And of course I've left out that you've got to have a combustion chamber for all of these. But now fan and the turbines that drive it are N1 and they spin the slowest. N2 compressor and N2 turbines spin, spin faster. And then the N3 compressor blades and the N3 turbines spin the fastest. And this is a little bit more fuel economy. It might have 1% better TSFC but now the engine weighs a little more, it's a little more complex, so you know, you gotta decide do I want a little bit more fuel efficiency, a little bit, one percent, or do I want a less complex, less expensive engine? And so it varies by airline as to what they want. And if you go to multi spool in addition to slow the fan, you can keep the compressors at high RPM and that'll give you the lower TSSC. And I already told you, N1 is going to be the slowest, N2 will be faster, and if you have a three-spool engine, N3 would be the fastest. Now, another way to do that, to drive the fan, the, uh, the, Gen, the Gen X engine that's going to go on the Boeing 787, well, you know what they did? They got crazy. They said, we're going to put a big old honking fan on it instead of the 7 to 1 compression on a Boeing 777 they're going to put an 11 to 1 compression on the Boeing 787 engine so the fan is going to be a huge huge fan compared to the engine core oops and they said you know what it's going to be such a big diameter that having a turbine in the back isn't going to work out too well so you know what they're going to do they're going to put a gear reduction box. And they're going to have, you know, this will be N1, the N1 turbine. That's the N1 compressor. This would also be everything that the air goes through first and everything bolted onto it. So this would be the N1 compressor. And then they'll go and say, okay, now we'll put in the N2 compressor. So now we'll have the N2 compressor and we'll have the N2 turbine. And so now the fan speeds can be really, really slow because we've got this gearbox. <coughs> Excuse me. Now you're going, oh man, Mr. Johnson, this weight of this uh, gearbox is going to add engine weight. Certainly it is. Absolutely it is. But let's just say that this weighs 500 pounds. I have no idea. But we'll just say that this gearbox weighs 500 pounds. If on a typical flight on this airplane, again, we save 1,000 pounds of fuel because we can now have an 11 to 1 bypass ratio because we have this huge diameter fan, then that will give us, you know, 1,000 minus this 500, that will give us 500 pounds more payload in the term, in the term, in the way of, whoops, in the way of passengers and cargo and if we wanted to carry more fuel to fly farther we could do that so an engine manufacturer is finally determining that on a high bypass turbofan a, excuse me in fact one might call it a super high bypass turbofan don't write that down it's not an aviation term super bypass a very very high bypass turbofan somebody's decided you know what we're gonna put a reduction gearbox in it because the weight of it 
uh, is less than the amount of fuel that we could save on a typical flight. And of course I already told you that since the air goes through the fan, the fan is part of the compressor and you could actually call and say that the fan is part of the N1 compressor. Here's a JT9D. A JT9D had a 4 to 1 bypass ratio. It was the first engine that uh, came out on the, uh, let's see, a JT9D. It had a 4 to 1 bypass ratio. It came out on the Boeing 747-100. I think it went into service back in 1969. And here is the rotating fan. Here's the stationary blade. And we're going to have air going through the bypass. So your air is going to go through the bypass. This is the rotating blade and this is going to straighten it out so it'll go straight. However, some of the air, ta-da, if this is rotating, stationary, rotating, stationary, rotating, stationary, rotating, stationary. Now this fan and all of these blades right here are going to be hooked up to this an inside tube. Instead of solid, it's going to be an inside tube and here's a turbine and here's a turbine here's a turbine whoops and here's a turbine so this inside tube is going to run the fan and it's going to run the first part of the compressor then and remember this is 1969 is when it went into production then stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary rotating stationary we're gonna have all these blades that rotate and these blades that rotate along the stationary ones and they're hooked up to a tube on the outside so this spool is on the outside and it's driven and here's a turbine and here's a turbine here's a turbine here's a turbine so this in blue This is going to be the N1 compressor, which includes the fan and includes those compressors. And here we're going to have the N1 turbine. So if we look up the tailpipe, we're going to see the N1 turbine. If we look into the intake, we're going to see the N1 compressor, which includes the fan. And then here is the N2 compressor. And here is the N2 turbine. And I think this is way cool because if you look, Look how small the combustion chamber is. Can you make that noise? Good. It actually looks like one of the smallest parts of the engine. Um, if we look at this engine, and let's just say we start out at sea level, here's 14.7 PSI. By the time we get into this combustion chamber, pressure is going to be huge. You know, if we have a 30 to 1 compression ratio across all of these compressor blades, then 30 to 1 times that, that's going to be about 450, 450 PSI. Okay, so if each one of these has a 1.2 to 1 compression ratio, and there's, let's say, five of them, the pressure here is not going to be as big as the discharge pressure is coming out of the last part of the compressor. So if we had to call one of these low pressure and one of them high pressure, we'd call the N1 the low pressure compressor. And we would call the N2 is the high pressure compressor. The discharge pressure coming out of the N1 is a lower pressure than the pressure that's coming out of N2, so N2 would be the high pressure compressor. Now, we're going to burn our fuel, we're going to, you know, mix it with air so it's not so hot, for, so it hits the turbine blades and doesn't melt them. We're going to have high velocities we're going to have high pressures. As we run air across those rotating blades, we're going to extract energy. That means in the turbine section, Bernoulli's theorem doesn't work. So Bernoulli's theorem does not work in the turbine section because these blades are extracting energy, and Bernoulli's theorem only works in a closed energy system. You don't add, can't add any or subtract any. In this case, we're subtracting energy. So as the air goes through the turbine blade, velocity is going to go down, and static pressure is going to go down. We go through another turbine blade, pressure is going to go down, velocity is going to go down. So if we measured what's the pressure going into the N2 turbine, 
N2 turbine. We measure the pressure going into the N2 turbine, and then we also measure the pressure going into the N1 turbine. We'd have we wouldn't have extracted as much energy right here, so the pressure going into the N2 turbine is going to be higher. So the N2 turbine is going to be called the high pressure turbine, and the N1, since the pressure is less in it, it's going to be called the low pressure turbine. So just like the N1 turbine drives the N1 compressor, the low pressure turbine drives the low pressure compressor, and the high pressure turbine drives the high pressure compressor. And we've already talked about low spool compressor. Hey, I already did that. Yay, it's as if I knew what I was talking about. If you have any questions about compressors, please get a hold of me. I'd be happy to answer those questions. If you have suggestions on a better way to do this lecture, please let me know. Thank you very much.